Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarene, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Hello, uh, my name is Lou White. I'm with Torah Institute here in Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome, thank you for coming. And uh, we want to invite the spirit of Yahusha to be in our presence at all times. And if you have a comment or a question you'd like to add, remind me to repeat it if I didn't, so that the listening people on YouTube or on a DVD can understand it. But we'd like to start off today with uh, this concept that our heart is actually the goal of the, re of the dwelling place, of actual, the actual dwelling place of Yahuwah. We often have been taught that, you know, we're going to go to heaven or there's a, uh, there, that we're going to go to heaven after we die or something like that and then we're going to be with him forever. But it, the reality of it is he's going to take up residence in his house, which is us. He created us for that purpose. And our hearts are wicked. They're rebellious. That's what rebellion is. It's, it's witchcraft. It's, it's uh, going against his will. And we want to uh, accept him. He says, let me come in. I'm knocking at the door, the gate of your heart. That's what it's really about. And we're actually a group of people here on the earth now, rising up in the last days. We are called Nazarim, and that is because we're branches of his teachings. But that's because his indwelling in those people, us, uh, has actually taken up um, uh, a kind of rebellion of itself. So we're going to put a little spin on the idea of rebellion. We're a rebellion of love. And that, this is what I want to take you to in, in Scripture. We all know about the apostasy or the falling away or the turning away from the Torah. That has happened continually throughout history. And all we have to do is go back to the garden and we can see that that's what happened. They turned away from the words of Yahuwah. And Israel was ejected into the world because of one thing. They rejected his words. That was the falling away too. They're all falling away, falling away, falling away. Now, in the last days, we have something that appears in the scriptures that's in 2 Thessalonians that's discussing a falling away in order to reveal lawlessness in men. And the men that we see in the day, in this country at least, they've turned away from the creator completely and his law, and they won't even let little children hear of his existence in the school systems, you know? And for that reason, generations of young people have grown up into adulthood and spawned children of their own who know nothing about a creator. In fact, it's foreign to them. They don't even know what the concept is because the government has been seeking us to worship it. And we see that something over 40% of the population is now dependent on government for their very lives. And that is because of their turning away from Yahuwah and depending on him, but depending on government instead. And governments have always been wanting to seek worship. And you know, that's what we're going to see, I think, if, as we progress. Now, really quickly, we're going to just run through these terms. If you're watching this, you can back this up on a DVD or on YouTube. But the terminology we're going to use today are not the traditional terms. We're, we're going to not use the word Lord. We're going to use the word Yahuwah, which is his name. It's spelled with four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Ua, He. Natan Yahu is three of those letters uh, in Yahu, Yahuwah. Now, the name of the Messiah is Yahusha or Yahushua, and it can be shortened to Yeshua. Those three are all found in the text of Scripture. The most prevalent one is the five-lettered one, Yahusha. And uh, the word Mashiach was attempted to be transliterated in the Greek as Messiah. They don't have a word like that. So we're going to use the word Mashiach or Messiah, and we're not going to need the word Christos at all or Christianos, because that's Greek. You know, it was found three, well, actually, uh, the word Christianos was found three times in the writings, in the Greek. 
Of course, we're not, he weren't, they weren't speaking Greek to, to one another. But, uh, and now the word uh, El, El or Elohim means strength or mighty one. You know, the, that's the, uh, a pronoun that's similar to father, mother, Elohim. You know, it's not a name. And G-O-D is not a name, but G-O-D is a corrupt word because of the fact that it was adopted from the Teutonic peoples and applied to the supreme being. If you just check the encyclopedia, look that up. Now, the, the Yahudim are one of the tribes of Israel, just one of the tribes. It's the royal tribe from which all the kings come. And they today are called Judah or Jews, but the original term is Yahudi or Yahudim, the plural. Not Sarim is what we're called, Acts 24, verse 5. And if we... Uh, Look at Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah 31, verse 6. It says that the Nazarim are going to rise on the hills of Ephraim, which is one of the references to the northern tribes in general. And uh, we're going to display a different, a different heart because we're going to be indwelled in the last days and we're going to beseech people to come in and come out of her. Yisrael are all the tribes. And actually, everybody alive is probably a seed of Abraham, you know. But uh, Abraham, Ishak, and Yaakov, those are the fathers of the tribes. And, of course, uh, Israel was the new name given to Yaakov. Anyway, we're going to run right into this and uh, see what we can find out. The name of this one I gave a Greek word to. It's the word apostasia. Now, that's two different components, apo and stasia. And we're going to look at that very closely to understand it. There's a Hebrew word, it's sara. Sara means the same thing. It's a rebellion. The rebellion against something, a power, an authority. Now, a revolution of love is what it is. And it's here to resist the powers of the dragon in the last days. That's why we're going to be, some of us are going to be killed, beheaded, and resisted. And, um, we have this uh, sun deity or this Babylonian Elohim, sovereignness of the heavens, depicted up here so that maybe you all don't know this, but that's who that is. She has had many names. We're going to call her Babel because that's what scripture calls her. She's been known by these other terms that you see. Now, uh, the, 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 we call it the statue of L-I-B-E-R-T-A-S today. But that's really not, that's just a, a Latin form. But we're still honoring these idols, and we need to do away with them. And it's, she's also known as the Great Mother, riding a beast. In Yirmiyahu 25, 31, it says, Tumult shall come to the ends of the earth, for Yahuwah has a controversy with the nations. He shall enter into judgment with all flesh. The wrong he shall give to the sword, declares Yahuwah. Thus said Yahuwah of hosts, See, evil is going forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind is raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. Now, we're, some, we're told in Scripture to come out of her. Now, let's look for the her in some of these texts that we're going to have. Babel is a woman described in Scripture as riding a beast. The dragon is Satan, the devil. And there's a revolution of love that's here to resist the dragon because love is how we overcome. You overcome evil with good, and good is love. And evil is hate. That's as simple as I can put it. Now, the dragon has given power and authority to a beast. This woman and the beast are used by the dragon to deceive the whole world through teachings from a golden cup held in the hand of the woman, Babel. When the sovereign of esteem, now that's Yahuwah, comes into our heart, that's his dwelling place. That's the one he designed for himself, without, made without hands, a temple made without hands. When, when, he, when the sovereign of esteem comes into our heart, then we become combatants and we're rebellious against this woman and the beast. And we're, we're, we're loving, we're not, our, our weapons are not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're, they're, uh, they're spiritual. 
And we're combatants against the principalities of darkness, and we have the order to come out of her. Now, to come out of her, we have to commission ourselves or be commissioned to do something else. Now, just recently, uh, last week, in fact, during Halloween, the week of Halloween, this Frankenstorm hit the United States, and it covered an area the size of Europe. It was a monster. And they're, now they're being, they're all, a lot of them in the dark by the millions, and they're now being, uh, there's a huge wave of Canadian air that's freezing them. They have no heat, they have no gas, they have no electricity, they have no uh, water. They're just, uh, they're floundering. And this is the densest populated area of this country. Now, is that judgment? Some would say it is. Because this country has turned its back. The government has turned its back and forced people to not speak of him. Now, in Yirmiyahu 23, starting at verse 18, it says, For who has stood in the council of Yahuwah, and who has seen and heard his word? Who has listened to his word and obeyed it? See, a storm of Yahuwah shall go forth in a rage, a whirling storm. It whirls on the head of the wrong. The displeasure of Yahuwah shall not turn back until he has done and established the purposes of his heart. In the latter days, you shall understand it perfectly. Now, there's a door that we talked about earlier, the door to your heart. It's a gate that you must open because someone is knocking. Now, the heart is where your decision begins. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And uh, one of the disciples or students of Yahushua said, uh, he was, his name was Yehuda. It wasn't the one that, dis, that uh, betrayed him. He asked how they would see him, but not the world. That's an interesting thing, too, because they would see him. He says, I go away, and you, but yet you will see me very soon. And they were going to, he was going to take up residence in their hearts. And that's where his objective is. In Yahukanen, or John 14, verse 23, Yahusha answered Yehuda and said, If anyone loves me, he shall guard my word. And my father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. In other words, take up residence in them, you know, his followers. And that's what we're seeing today is happening. This word apostasia. Is the, is the Greek word, but uh, it's a rebellion against authority and power. But, but what authority and power? Because it's here now, and we are the revolution, but it's a revolution of love. And we're preceding the arrival of the new reign, just like you would see in a regular uh, resistance where a government gets really out of control and the people rise up and they overthrow that government. Well, we don't have to overthrow the government, but our love will overcome it. But it's really Yahushua who will overthrow it. The power that we're rebelling against is the reign of the beast, which is here. Many people have thought the beast system is coming. And that's what I always heard when I was listening to teachers. But I thought, wait, wait a minute, the beast is, is here. It's always been here. It's been here, and it's called Babel. Now, there's two levels of the Greek and the Hebrew words. In fact, many of our English words have two levels of meaning. One is a concrete or tangible meaning, like the, the root in the word apostasia, apostasia, is the root is S-T-A, stay, or sta. And it's in words like stand, stay, statue, mainstay, mast, and staros, and staro. The Latin. Now, the figurative or abstract meaning of the root sta is fixed or remain, steadfast, rigid, or genuine. In other words, it's something you stand for. It's, uh, it's something that you stand for. Now, in the case of this, it has the APO in front of it, which means away. So you stand away from something. So we're standing away from the reign of the beast. And that's what I'm going to point out from the scriptures we're going to look at. Now, the, that's the word, and we're going to review that again. 
the, this is coming soon to a planet near you, the kingdom of Yahuwah. It's actually here now, and it came with Yahusha, but it's going to be coming in fullness where the whole world will see it. But right now, it's only in his people, so we see him. And he's the ruler, and we're his domain. It's not so much a spatial thing, it will be, of course, but his dominion is over his, his people. And uh, we, we're citizens ruled by his laws, his instructions, the Torah. And we stand away from the world system. We see all sorts of things that are wrong because our perspective is his perspective. He gave us his perspective. So if we see a picture of these people, the beast and the woman shaking hands, and we see an altar dedicated to a Greek deity, or we hear that the Olympic Games are about to start, well, we know what that is. That's governments promoting the worship of a false deity. But they really are directing it towards themselves by means of this deception. In the dragon, it's mentioned here in Revelation 13, verse 4, and they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to fight with him? Now, government has been seeking worship, and that's what we're pointing to here. Mankind has set, him, set himself up through government in order to build a name for himself without Yahuwah involved, and he's the highest authority. That's what secular humanism teaches. Humanism, secular humanism, as opposed to spiritual humanism. You know, It's not spiritual, it's secular. And we stand for Yahuwah's Torah, but we stand away from the world system. Now the kingdom of Yahuwah is the reign of Yahuwah, and the dwelling place of Yahuwah is all about this mystery, Messiah, the spirit of Yahusha in you. And that's why we are rebellious against the world system because that's the realm of the beast. Ephesians 6, 12 says, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. And we are called to become citizens of another reign that will ultimately overcome all former reigns. All of this is like a, a huge overview of what Daniel was shown. You know, we are, the, we are the habitation of the spirit of Yahusha. We are his dwelling place, his temple, his heckle. And we're a tre his treasure is in earthen vessels. The reign of Yahuwah is Yahusha in us. The armor that we wear is Yahusha's own strength. And we stand, there's that word S-T-A, that's in Stasia, in the strength of the mightiness of Yahusha. Ephesians 6.10 says, For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength, because he's in you. Put on the complete armor of Elohim, and you only put it on once. You don't have to keep putting it on, taking it off for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim, so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day, and having done all, to stand. That's to be fixed as a as a rebel. <laughs> Yahushua's presence in us gives us the heart of a lion. And that heart that he's given us is a stubbornness to be obedient to his Torah. So to stand for him in his words means we're sealed in his name as his property. Because without being sealed in his name, we're just floundering around. We're following all kinds of winds of doctrine. Now, the first order of the day when he came to announce the kingdom was repent for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. The reign of Yahuwah reigns in men's hearts and women's hearts. And this reign is found in his living words, and that's the covenant of loving kindness. We're going to cover that real soon here. When we receive his life in us, then we have the guts to obey him. It's a revolutionary idea to obey the Ten Commandments, isn't it? I mean, if you went to a, a Christian seminary, if you just raised your hand and told one of the professors, what if we just went ahead and obeyed the commandments as they're written? 
well, we don't have to obey those. That's what they'll tell you, you know. But yet, it's a revolutionary idea that we've been promoting for many years now that we are to obey the commandments as they're written and focus on the goal of love, you know, because that's what they're given for, to teach us how to love Yahuwah and how to love our neighbor. Who is able to stand and fight with the beast? That question was asked in scripture. Revelation 13, one through four. And I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and on his horns, 10 crowns and on his heads, names of blasphemy. And, and the beast I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as having been slain to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the earth marveled after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to fight with him? See, that's the worship of the dragon by means of the, they worship the beast too. And that's the, the governmental system, you know, the, the rulers and authorities, which also involve all these circuses out there. The Nazarene are the ones that can fight them. Now, we're fighting them not with flesh and blood, though. We're fighting them with the, the word of Yahuwah. That's what our, our weapon of war is. It's his word. It is written. Who is able to fight with him? The true followers. Luke 9, 1 and 2 say this, And having called his twelve taught ones together, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the reign of Elohim and to heal the sick. Now, it, we're, that's what we're doing here is we're proclaiming the reign of Yahuwah, the reign of Elohim. Everything is done in an orderly way. Uh, as the reign of Yahuwah comes, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at 23, and each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming, then the end, when he delivers up the reign of Elohim, the Father, when he has brought to naught all rule and authority and power, for he has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Where's he gonna reign from though? We're not gonna be going up into the sky. He's coming back home. He created the earth as his own home and his people to be the temple. Now that's something you don't hear very often, but that's the objective. We do not obey them because we're obeying another. We're obeying Yahuwah, the one that made us to be vessels for his habitation. Like Yahushua, we're looked upon as rebels, for we are rebels against the pretenders and their authorities. Luke 20:20 20, 20 says they were trying to trap Yahushua. And keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be righteous to catch him in a word in order to deliver him to the rule and to the authority of the governor. See, because the, govern, the government is constantly competing with the authority of Yahuwah. Anyway, when you stand away from something, it means that you're separating yourself out of it. You're, you're coming out of it. And there's been many examples of that in the religious systems of men. And we have early Christianity and all these schisms, you know, this, these branches, these divisions, where one person came with, upon a little truth or a little heresy, either one, and they would separate away from the main group. The parting of ways in the first century, believe it or not, one of the biggest contributing factors why the, well, the early followers of Yahushua were mostly of the uh, people of Israel. And the Gentiles were, they were wondering how in the world can a Gentile be saved? How can they become part of this, this redemption plan? So what happened was the Gentiles started to come in and they were converted and immersed in the name of Yahushua for the forgiveness of their sins. And they, were, they became one body along with the believing Yahudim. But something had happened very early in the, I mean, well, it was in the middle section of the uh, first century. And I'm gonna show you that. Yisrael divided into two kingdoms earlier, 
the reign of Rehoboam and Jeroboam in BCE 932. And that separation was a schism too. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern Israelite kingdom of Israel after the revolt of the 10 northern Israelite tribes against Rehoboam that put an end to the united monarchy. Jeroboam reigned for 22 years. Now, that was a tax revolt. It was over a tax issue. Uh, the successor of Shlomo, or, Mo, or Solomon, his son, decided to impose an even higher tax upon the people, so the northern ten tribes seceded away. It was like a civil war. And they just said, well, that's it. We're going to have our own temple here. And they put their temple in Samaria, or Shomron. Now, later on, Gentile believers separated in the first century from the believers that were of Jewish descent, or Yahudim. Now, what that was about was uh, the Fiscus Judaicus, which is the Jewish tax. And I'll show you how that happened. After Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 CE, something really heinous happened. In fact, every time, I'm going to show you some pictures of things that will remind you of this from now on, because you're not getting told. Anyway, in the synagogue or the assembly of the, of the Jewish people or the Israelite people, okay, um, they had a Gentile population, and they would come together as one, you know, and they were one. But then something happened after the temple was destroyed, and I'm going to show you what, what that was, and they wanted to be separated, and it was over taxation, at least in part. It contributed to it. Anyway, I'm going to go back here and ex explain a little bit about the heart first. We have three areas of temptation. We have flesh, eyes, and pride. Those are basically pleasure, possessions, and position. And those are the things that government officials are always going for. They're always getting in trouble with these three things. They're, they're getting paid off. They're, you know, there's women involved in their lives. And, you know, it's about their heart, though. Their heart is wicked. Pleasure and possessions and power are at the heart of many divisions. So it is about the heart. Now back to the Fiscus Judaicus, this Jewish tax started. In the very early part of the 70s, not the 1970s, but the 70s, after the Jerusalem temple was destroyed, there was a, a Roman tax that was instituted after it was destroyed. It was imposed by Vespasian, the new emperor. Vespasian was one of the two people that attacked Israel, Vespasian and his son Titus, okay? Now, here's what, what's going on. Formerly, the annual half shekel that was given by all Israelites to support the temple of, at Jerusalem, according to the scriptures, was not given anymore, but it was given to support the temple of this deity that you see pictured here. This statue that you're looking at is the very statue that was in the temple of J-U-P-I-T-E-R. And they were this tax was then imposed only on the Yahudim and those that acted according to the commandments in the Torah. And so they all had to pay this tax. And they, the ones that didn't pay were killed. It was very serious. And it was across the entire empire. People that had never heard of any of this at all were being imposed this tax just because something happened a long way off. Now, how do you think that made everybody feel? Well, some of the people that were formerly Gentiles were probably thinking, well, I, this is a heavy burden on me. I don't think I have to pay that because I'm not Jewish. Well, that's part of the separation. Then they started to meet separately. A lot of people don't understand, well, why did they start meeting separately? It's because of this tax, in part, because they wanted to not be identified with them, because they wouldn't be fa they'd be found fellowshipping with them, and then so the fellowshipping started. This is a parting of the ways. So Vespasian and his son Titus were the rulers after the, the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, they celebrated this conquering by issuing a coin. Uh, Vespasian has his image on this coin here, and then. Judea Capta is there, the captivity of Judah, you know. Well, anyway, then they built these two arches, uh, one for Vespasian and one for Titus. Now, Titus's arch is still in existence. Vespasian's arch is not. But uh, inside the arch, you can see this is what's inside of it, and they're celebrating 
the booty that they looted from Jerusalem. Now, one million perished in this. There's a better photo photograph of it. That's what's inside this arch. And you can see they're carrying away all the temple things and many of the things that were in the temple that were valuable. And uh, the menorah is one of them. And of course, some say that the menorah is still down there in some of the catacombs of the Vatican because they're, uh, you know, holding it. Some people have said they've seen it, you know, living people. But uh, they're not admitting it, at least not openly. But here's the thing. What did they do with all that loot? Let me show you what they did with it. I'm going to show you in just a moment. First, let's talk about Tisha B'Av. That was the, the ninth of Av. Tisha means ninth. It was a tradition of tragedy for all three of the times that, you know, that, that they were attacked. Uh, in 70 CE, Vespasian and Titus destroyed the nation, you know, and screams of horror could be heard rising from the whole city. Flavius Josephus, the historian that was a Jewish person, he wrote in his book, The History of the Jews, quote, the slaughter within was even more dreadful than the spectacle from without. Men and women, old and young, insurgents and priests, those who fought and those who entreated mercy were hewn down in indiscriminate carnage. The number of the slain exceeded that of the slayers. The legionnaires, that would be the Roman soldiers, had to clamor over heaps of the dead to carry on the work of extermination. This building that you see lying in ruins had arches all over it with pagan deities in each of the arches. This thing is called the Roman Colosseum, and it was built with the money that was looted from Jerusalem. Mm. Anyway, uh, Vespasian start, started the building of it, and his son Titus finished it. It took about 20 years to build it, but uh, it, it lies in ruins now. Now, this site that we just looked at, paid for with the looting of Jerusalem, is in ruins. Let's read Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Vengeance is mine, and repayment at the time their foot slips. For near is the day of their, of their calamity, and the matters prepared are hastening to them. Here's another site that was a horrible thing. It, it was, uh, there were 960 Yahudim resistors who died at Masada. And uh, they, they resisted as long as they could. So anyway, we're talking about apostasia, the standing away from something. Now, if we're going to be standing for something, then we need to make sure it's truth. You know? Now, if we're standing according to the doctrines, if we're standing on doctrines of men, Doctrines of men are going to pass away, but Yahuwah's word will never pass away. So we want to stand on his word. Now, here we have a, a ritualistic thing going on where we're, we're seeing a bar mitzvah. And these young men are studying the Torah, but they're given a little book that instructs them how to deal with what they're reading in the bigger, the scroll of Torah. Well, one book says not to say the name Yahuwah with the proper vowels, but to say Adonai in place of it. This book says to proclaim his name. Which book are you going to go by? You have to make a stand. You have to stand. Are you going to stand for Yahuwah and against human traditions? Or are you going to stand for human traditions and just go along with that? And then Yahuwah is going to one day say, well, why didn't you stand with me? You know. So I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying that they have to open their eyes. They're being blinded by human traditions. You know. Yes? In the corner of that picture, it said, Lou said the vowel points, the Nazarenes made up. Yeah, they made them up. Who else did? Well, but, um, we can defend them, but I'm not going to defend them, but go ahead. Why, the vowel points. Why did you make that as a point? Well, I made that point because the Maserets just made up the vowel points. Now, they were 2,300 years removed from Moshe. Now, we're... Uh, 400 plus years removed from Shakespeare. Do we know what, how he pronounced words? Do we? Mm -hmm. And well, we can go, we can pretend that we know and say, well, let's go over to England now. But you see, language is something that's living and it's always going through transitions and changes. And when we say, oh, 
or ooh, we might be off, you know. So when we say the, when I say the Maserats just made up the vowel points as best they could, they were guessing. And we're holding them up as rigid, sure things, and they're not. They're just vowel points that were created in order for us to say the words. But the real reason that they really wanted to do this is to obfuscate, circumambulate around the name. See, the name, they don't want you to say the name. The name is forbidden. <laughs> and why would that be? Because the Maserets wrote the vowels of the word Adonai to cue the reader to not say it in order to say the other word. Now that's a documented fact. If you read the encyclopedias on this subject, you will find that this is the real reason behind those vowel points is to say another word. My understanding had been that when they uh, did the Masoretic text between 600 and 800 AD, that they were trying to come up with this close to the original right. as they could possibly do. They could, yes. And even though they were attempting to, they're, they're, they're not exactly accurate. They're probably accurate in some cases. We could probably just, uh, but it's only a matter of what we decide that they were right about that really matters and, uh, to us. And then we get into arguments and divisions even now among the not serene. You know, but all I'm trying to point out is that let's not be too fixed on anything and let's not say that you have to believe my way. See, I'm not saying to anybody to pronounce the name Yahuwah and only that way. Because if you want to use other letters, that's fine. It's just that I'm trying to minimize the letters so that we can keep it as simple as possible. And the straightforward message gets through. But if people want to make it more complicated, they can certainly do that. And they can change it entirely and add things, but that's not what we do. You know, I don't do that. I it is to... interesting that the Semitic languages did not have vowels. That is true. They some of them were well, they did because the four the name is in four vowels. Josephus admits that the name itself that was on the you know, the plate of the high priest was written in four vowels. Had four vowels? Yeah four vowels. They are written sometimes, and uh, sometimes they operate as consonants, and sometimes they operate as vowels. So vowels did exist, but the vowel points of the Maserets were a tool, a device to be helpful. That's certainly true. I mean, they were trying to be helpful in order to pronounce the words, because when you've got two relatively uh, dif difficult words, it makes it difficult to understand. Well, when you have the same letter that represents a consonant in one case and a vowel in another, it can be a little bit difficult to sit mm -hmm. down and read a text and understand the words that are being conveyed. That is true. So yeah. the vowel points would indicate to people whether it's a consonant or a vowel. The vowel points are helpful. Yes, they are. But uh, like I say, the Maserets just made them up, and if they didn't, who did? It was, they didn't exist. So that's all my point was in this. And we shouldn't necessarily discount them entirely. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they did make them up. But we can, we can look at them, you know. But we don't have to be contentious over their way of seeing it. Now, the living words, they're the heart of the rebellion that we're involved in. Acts 7, 37 records Stephen's words before the Sanhedrin. And he was resisting a, a, a human or power and authority. Now, in verse 37 of Acts 7, it says, This is the Moshe who said to the children of Israel, Yehua, your Elohim, shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. In other words, Moshe was explaining that about Yehusha coming. Him you shall hear. Now, the word hear is shamar, which means to hear and obey. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke with him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living words to give to us. Now, when he received the living words, what do you imagine they were? Well, it was the covenant. The rebel Stephen lovingly confronts the spiritual authorities depicted in this, in this artist's rendition. Malachi 4 talks about these the same thing. 
In verse 4 through 6, it says, Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you Eliyah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. The day of Yahuwah. That's an end times thing. And he shall turn the hearts, the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and, oh, wait a minute, let's see how back to He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Before the day of Yahuwah, there's got to be a decision be made in the hearts of everybody. The hearts of the fathers to the children means that the fathers are going to teach their children. But the children are the children of Israel and they've got to turn their hearts back to the fathers being Abraham, Ishak, and Yaakov. <laughs> And of course, that would have to include Yahuwah too. Anyway, here's a gentleman saying, the Torah of Moshe, they taught me that was legalistic. <laughs> you know. Now, let our hearts remember those rulings now, if our hearts can. Here's the retelling of the covenant for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days, given at Deuteronomy 5. Verse 6 starts out saying with number 1, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mizraim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day. That's the Sabbath day. To set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And they shall remember that you, and you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now the Sabbath day is mentioned, I'm just going to take a little aside here. Acts 1 verse 12 says, Then they went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And then continuing right on in that same area of the scripture, it says, hear, O Yisrael. That means hear and obey, shamar. Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your heart, and with all your being, and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now here's a question. Can you repent, that means to turn away from sin, by ignoring some or all of the Ten Commandments that we just finished reading? Is that possible? Not really. What are we supposed to repent from? The commandments? No. No. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who shall not walk in the counsel of the wrong, 
and shall not stand in the path of sinners and shall not sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah, and he meditates in his Torah day and night. For he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. The wrong are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wrong shall not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahuwah knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wrong comes to naught. So the good news, or the gospel, is actually the living words. Romans 10, 16 starts out saying, However, not all obeyed the good news. For Yeshiyahu says, Yahuwah, who has believed our report? So then belief comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Yahuwah, or Elohim. But I ask, did they not hear? Yea, indeed, their voice went out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Yisrael not know? First, Moshe says, I shall pr provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I shall enrage you by an unwise nation. And Yeshayahu boldly says, I was found by those not seeking me. I was made manifest to those not asking for me. And to, it, to Yisrael, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and back-talking people. Now, what is sin? Well, sin is a debt. It's a debt that we're unable to repay because we're either enslaved to sin or we're enslaved to righteousness. And you're, you're, a, you're a servant of the one that you obey. If you obey sin, then you're going to end up dead uh, spiritually and eternally. Now, you can be freed from that debt. There is a way that you can do that. You turn to your Redeemer, the one that has a love for you. And he wants you to open your heart to him. So you can be, have this debt paid. And it's inherited from the first Adam. The second Adam is able to deliver or, or to redeem all mankind because he's a close relative. From, a close relative is the only one that can redeem you legally. And he is a close relative because he is the son of Adam. See, so we're related. Being all descended from Adam... And he included, he becomes a redeemer because, you know, he's able to repay the debt. Now, without accepting our redeemer, there's no hope to repay the debt. We are leprous and need to receive the healing touch of the great physician, Yahushua, because we live in bodies of death. If you could look at your body in a time lapse, if you lived 50, 60, 70 years, 80 years, if you saw it in time lapse, it would look like you had leprosy. <laughs> you were, you're just shriveling and just, you know, just changing. And eventually you'll start decaying because you'll die. You'll pass into, into death and you'll return to dust. Now, John, or Yehuchan in 3, 36 says, He who believes in the Son possesses everlasting life. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of Elohim remains on him. So we're redeemed from corruption, decay, and death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47 through 53 says, the first man was of the earth, earthy. The second man is the master from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the likeness of the earthy, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. And this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. See, I speak a secret to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed." For this corruptible has to put on incorruption and this mortal to put on immortality. See, he was even expecting it to happen during his lifetime. That's why he phrased it the way it was. Now, the rebellion against authority and power started in our modern times right here on, on Halloween. <laughs> you know, this is the All Saints 
building at uh, Wittenberg, Germany. It's interesting that it was called All Saints because November 1st was called All Saints Day. He, uh, Martin Luther, or Martin Luther, uh, nailed 95 theses on this door on the 31st of October in the year 1517. Now the apostasy is to come first and the man of lawlessness revealed. Now apostasy is the concrete level is to stand away from something, to move away. And that's obviously what happened. Protestants moved away because they were protesting. And abstractly, it's rebellion against authority. So the two words, apostasia, are stand away. So apo means away, and stasia means to stand, or recoil from, or come out of. Revelation 18 gives us this command. Starting at verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from the heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues, because her sins have piled up to reach the heaven, and Elohim has remembered her unrighteousnesses. Her. Who's her? Babel. Mm -hmm. The man of sin or the man of righteousness? Yeah. Yeah. The name of Yahuwah seals us as his property. Now, just let that sink in for a moment. If you don't know his name, then you need to find out what it is and receive his name. And we come under his protection as a result because he's not going to protect property that's not his. There is one name given among men by which we must be delivered, Acts 4.12. The name is Yahusha, meaning Yah is our deliverer. There's no contest. That, that, that's what it means. And there's no other name. You can imagine there is, but there isn't. You can say, well, his name in Swahili is different. Yeah, it shouldn't be. <laughs> it's not Swahili. Now, Zechariah 3.8 says, Now listen, Yahushua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are men of symbol. For look, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Now this is where a lot of Yahudim don't know where the name of the Messiah was given. It's right there in Zechariah 3, verse 8. You know, blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. That's Psalm 118, verse 26. I find that interesting because verse 26 was an invention by a man, the verses and the, and the chapters. But 26 is significant because that's the name Yahuwah if you add it up numerically. yod He uh He, 26. There it is. Now the apostasy, or the standing away, is to come first, and the man of lawlessness revealed. Second Thessalonians, this is what I wanted to point to. Starting at verse 3 in chapter 2. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first, and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. The son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place, of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Now, secular humanism places man above all. And what is the dwelling place of Elohim? The objective is the, is the human heart. That's the dwelling place. A lot of people want to say, well, no, it's a temple. It's the place in Jerusalem. That was made by men's hands. And if they build another one, if they build another one, uh, is that really the dwelling place of Yahuwah? Uh-uh. The Hebrew word equivalent for apostasy is sara, and it means to revolt or rebel against an authority or a power. And just to clear up this, you probably have heard the word apogee and perigee. Well, the gee part means earth. It's Greek. And apo means away, and peri means near. So let's look at the far away and the draw near. And we'll use, we'll, we're going to let Yahushua point that out too. To draw near is to abide in or be near to. And to withdraw from means to be far from and live without something. Matthew 15 verse 5 says, but you say whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me has been dedicated. In other words, it's korban. It's dedicated to the temple is certainly released from, res from respecting his father or mother. So you have nullified the command of Elohim by your tradition. Hypocrites, Yeshayahu rightly prophesied about you, saying, this people draw near to me with their mouth 
and respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Apo peri, you see. But in vain they, do they worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. That's Yeshayahu uh, or Isaiah 29, verse 13. Now the word stasia in the Greek, stasia, okay, it means standing or the place where one is standing. And here's another example of this word. In an, you've heard the name Anastasia or Anastasia. Well, Anastasia has another prefix on it, which means again. So to stand, stasia, to stand again is hypothetically or you know, abstractly, a resurrection. And I'm going to show you how people misunderstood this too. Uh, so apostasia means to stand away. So it's a departing from something. So we're departing from something. We feel it as we don't do things that we used to do that we were taught. Now E.W. Bullinger, that's Ethelbert William Bullinger, back in the 1860s, he did these notes on this word apostasia. Now, here's what his note said. Apo governs only one case, the genitive, and denotes motion from the surface of an object as a line drawn from the circumference of an object. Hence, it is used of motion away from a place. Apo may be consequently be used of deliverance or passing away from a state or condition. In Greek, apo can be represented as a line drawn starting from the circumference of a circle and going away in an outward direction. Now here's the other part of the word. Stasia literally means a standing away. Well, actually, with apo. But this is his note, so he made a little grammatical error there. But it means to stand or to draw out, to separate. So the whole, world, the whole word means a standing away from, or a drawing out from, or a separation away from. And we're a peculiar people. We are meant to be a peculiar people. In order to be standing away from something, we have to stand away from it. Now, um, it also means a, a going out from among, which is the word, uh, to be, the called out ones, ekklesia in the Greek, to be called out. Is, is another form of this uh, idea. The original meaning of this word, which is agreed by many Greek scholars familiar with the ancient texts, is the departure. That's what they call it, the departure. This agrees with the definition of a way in Greek, which su suggests a motion from the surface or a motion away from a place as a line drawn from the circumference of an object. Now that's E.W. E. Bullinger, and he's continuing here. He says this. In the Geneva B-I-B-L-E, the Cramner, and it was first published in 1537, and the Tyndale version, published in 1539, which all preceded the King James Version, all translate this verse in this way. Before the day of the Lord comes, there must be a departure first. Now I'm showing you this because the word apostasia is translated as the word departure. Now, but this led to another uh, heresy. Based on this, some teach that the apostasy is the rapture, which is an easy mistake to make. That's why translations have to be accurate. We are now standing apart from the traditions and restoring the old paths, turning away from men's rules to serve our creator. That's what Yahushua was telling his own people in his time. And Stephen was telling the Sanhedrin the very same thing. It's a rebellion. They were rebelling against the men's traditions. That's what we're seeing happening now. Why is that? Because he's raising up Nazarene in the last days. Now, a better understanding of the word apostasia is here. The word apostasy is defined as a rebellion against authority, which most have interpreted to be a revolution against the gospel or the true message. Now that's what we can find a lot of texts that say that and, and they're correct too. There's a lot of scripture that talks about an apostasy. Well, there's not just one apostasy, there's a whole line of it from the Garden of Eden all, all the way forward. But here's another interpretation of that text at 2 Thessalonians chapter two. Notice the result of the falling away in this sentence is concurrent with the revealing of the man of lawlessness. 
quote, because the falling away is to come first, the falling away being the apostasia, and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. <laughs> so we are standing away from the lawless one, the lawless one. Second Thessalonians 6 through 12 says, and now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. And then the lawless one shall be revealed whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. For this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in the unrighteousness. The apostasy is the rebellion. The rebellion against the authority is against the dragon and the authority and power that he granted to the man of lawlessness through whom the whole world is deceived. By disobedience to the first four commandments, the whole world has been led astray by false teachers. I mean, they do disobey the four, first four commandments, don't they? So these puppies are saying, we haven't been obeying the first four commandments? The rebellion or revolution then ex is exposing the man of lawlessness. Secular humanism sets man above all that is called Elohim. Who would deny that? He shows himself that he is Elohim. 2 Thessalonians 3, I mean 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way because the falling away is to come first and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshipped so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Where is the dwelling place of Elohim? Human heart. That's where his intention is to be. And he will be there, but it's not going to be many that will accept him and open their door. So, hello, my name is Mr. Elohim. <laughs> man without Torah. Man is not Elohim. And here those puppies are saying, he's not? Well, we seem to be to dogs, don't we? But, uh, the kingdom of Yahuwah, or the reign of Yahuwah, is basically the way of Yahuwah, you know. It's where, it's where he is, you know, his words. Where, wherever his words are spoken, then he's in the midst of that uh, group. Uh, wherever two or more are gathered in his name, he is there. And it's embodied in his instructions, that's his character, it's written down. But it wants to jump up and become living and walking around in vessels. So those that obey those written instructions are acting them out. It's like words written on a piece of paper that are never spoken aloud. You know, if his name's written down and it's never spoken, what, what is the purpose of his name, you know? Uh, now, Torah is, the, is his living word, which is also abstractly living waters, and Yahushua is that word made flesh. We are able, unable to see the kingdom of Yahuwah until we submit to his will which is his covenant. The covenant, which is the 10 words, have his creative power within them to transform the hearts and minds to obedience. If you read his word and you break, and it breaks your heart that you're not keeping them, then he'll enable you to keep them. At the moment that we receive his spirit, we see his reign. The lie described in 2 Thessalonians chapter two is sent because those perishing refuse to receive a love for the truth. Now, what's the truth? His word. What's the word? His, his covenant. Which is his word. Those same ten words which are to be written or circumcised by him upon our hearts. By Yahushua. Who is the living spirit in us. And the secret is Mashiach in you. The temple. Colossians 1.27 is where that's found. The secret is with those who fear Yahuwah. And he makes his covenant known to them. That's 
Psalm 25, verse 14. And you should also read the entire chapter of Romans 12. Overcoming the sin mindset. When we are weak, then he is strong. Because we have to stop being strong. We have to let his strength be the thing that makes our hearts yearn to obey. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 says, And he said to me, My favor is is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, then, I shall rather boast in my weaknesses, so that the power of Messiah rests on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in insults, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for the sake of Messiah. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been impaled with Messiah, and I no longer live, but Messiah lives in me. And that which I now live in the flesh, I live by belief in the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. Every person should realize that. So we are the rebellion. It's a rebellion of love. The meaning of the text at 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 3, described, describing this apostasy has been a kind of sealed prophecy about us. His not serene in the last days. We are rebelling not against Yahuwah's authority, but against the authorities and powers given to the beast by the dragon. We are rebelling against human traditions, and Yahusha in us is restoring his covenant, repairing the breach. So we're told to come out of her, my people, her. Now, let's look for the her in this next text. Yermiyahu 51, verse 5. For neither Yisrael nor Yehuda, that's the northern tribes and the southern tribes, is widowed by his Elohim, Yahuwah of hosts, though their land has been filled with sin against the set-apart one of Yisrael. Flee from the midst of Babel, and let each one save his life. Do not be cut off in her crookednesses. For this is the time of the vengeance of Yahuwah, This is a prophecy about the distress of the last days. The recompense he is repaying her. Babel was a golden cup in the hand of Yahuwah, making drunk all the earth. The nations drank her wine, and that is why the nations went mad. Now that wine are the false teachings. Revelation 18, starting at verse 4, says, And I heard another voice from the heavens saying, Come out of her, my people lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Because her sins have piled up to reach the heaven and Elohim has remembered her unrighteousnesses. In Revelation 22, verse 13 says, I am the Aleph and the Ta, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those doing his commands so that the authority might be theirs unto the tree of life and to enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs and those who enchant with drugs and those who whore and the murderers and the idolaters and all who love and do falsehood. So Psalm 24 Verse 6 says, this is the generation of those who seek him. Yaakob, who seek your face. Salah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Who is the sovereign of esteem? Yahuwah, strong and mighty. Yahuwah, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Even lift up your everlasting doors. Now watch this. And let the sovereign of esteem come in. So, the door of your heart are those everlasting gates. The ultimate, I mean, that's the last thing to happen, you know. It's the final, the final thing. We're going to deal with that next time. Eschaton is going to be the title of the next one, Yahuwah willing. And we're going to look at the very final thing. The everlasting doors, the door to your heart. Hears him knocking. Revelation 3, 19 says, As many as I love, I reprove and discipline. So be ardent and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, that's his words, and opens the door, I shall come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's that simple. 
How could we possibly miss it? So our commission is not serene, involves that. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 say, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen.